Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to The Road to Recovery, The Road to Freedom with Mark. This is my 28-minute uh, show every day. I'm laughing a bit because poor old Michael was <laughs> just in here trying to sort things out. Houston, we have a problem, and this is what happens with live radio, is that uh, sometimes uh, machines just don't do as they're told. And you have to decipher the reason as to why, because they're not about to tell you. And luckily, Michael, good as he is, the station manager down here managed to un unravel the problem within a few minutes. Just a power cut. Threw this old keyboard out, this old switchboard, so <clears throat> blimey. Bit of fun and games, bit of panic at the disco, but hey, we're there. Thank you, Michael, for getting us up and running. The road to recovery is a program I've been doing for many, many years um, with the support of Arrow Radio, and it's, it's about mental health issues, and I started doing this a long, long time before this became popular, before anybody was hope, when things were pretty grim and hopeless, actually, before John Kerwin and Mike King, or right at the very beginning uh, of when they first started this whole thing. And... The attitude in those days when they got these ex-rugby players on and stuff like that to talk about these issues, there was this real shock and surprise and initially and then interest and enthusiasm by some as it went on. But um, I think if you had to epitomise the problems that men face in this world over mental health issues... Um, it's probably never been epitomised better than in rugby and even more specifically with professional rugby because of a number of issues. One is that rugby in the past was always a very sexist culture. Um, back in the day of Athletic Park, you would go to a game and there wouldn't be a single woman there. Totally different now. You wouldn't recognise it now. And it's a completely different animal. The attitude changed totally and rugby started poking its head up from the parapet and looking around and realising that if it was to survive, that it would have to change and evolve and adapt to accept women as part of the audience for a rugby game and realise that this game may very well appeal not just to the wives and girlfriends but to um, the female general public at large and of course they were right because with females came families and the whole game changed as it is it evolved from amateur to to professional. Back in the day, the amateur game was a game for hard men. And if you weren't a hard man, then they'd tell you to harden up. You dislocate a thumb, or you just pop the bugger back in, and you run back on, son, and you give it everything. You got knocked out. They give you a bit of smelling salts, and you ran back on, because you didn't want to give up. See, because it was all about not giving up and being tough and toughing it out and hardening it up. And, of course, that attitude of just getting over something and boxing on regardless led to a lot of destruction of a lot of people's lives and a lot of failures because people didn't know how to cope and there, there was nothing there. And certainly when um, my mental issues started to absolutely cripple me and, and, and stop me from even continuing a normal life. There were friends of mine who, of course, are no longer friends of mine who just said to me, I'll oh, just harden up, mate. And um, that was the attitude that you were somehow weak if you showed any, any form of being unwell in any way. That was seen as weakness either physical or, or mental weakness and, and that you were a lesser person if you let your emotions get the better of you because big boys don't cry and, and men are tough. And that attitude, just like the attitude towards the exclusion of women from the game of rugby union, has done a complete 
180 degree. An absolute U-turn on this whole deal. Not only do we now have women watching the game, we also have um, we have women audiences, we have mums, we have families, but now we have magnificent female players who are, um, you know, getting involved in every level of the game uh, to the point of professionalism, although, of course, it's got a long way to go before it catches up with the man's side of the game, which is so often the case, especially if it started as a, as a male-dominated game. But to see the skill level, I honestly never thought that I would see females playing rugby as good as men or sometimes even better and you know the level of professionalism especially in New Zealand has has risen amazingly and I think it is very good for everybody's mental health if we approach team sports in the right way and we take out the good parts of team sport that we focus our um, aggressiveness and competitiveness towards achieving goals and working as a team and supporting each other and being there for each other. Those principles of the game are the things that I love. You know, people working towards a common goal, sacrificing for others around them, caring as much about their teammates as they care for themselves to the point where they function as a single unit. And this is a life lesson that we try and teach our children to bring forward into society. But of course, you know, the job market is an adversarial place where people put themselves upon each other and forget this whole idea of teamwork. And unfortunately, the greatest failures in that regard are always management who seem to feel that they have to be a boss and dominate people and tell people what to do regardless of the fact that those under them might be more competent than themselves and that being the case they become jealous and target those people for punishment for being better and I've seen it happen many 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 times I've had dozens of jobs over the years and very very few times have I ever come across a good CEO, a good area manager or a good branch manager. They are as rare as hen's teeth. When you do get a good one, it's amazing. You know, the whole company flourishes, the culture is great, the business is successful, clean, tidy, making money, everyone's committed, enthusiastic, motivated and everybody wins. And the culture completely changes to a point of, oh, why didn't we do this before? <coughs> Excuse me, I'm almost choking on those words because I've seen it happen so many times and I've been involved at the very grassroots level and changed cultures of companies on my own, you know, just as started groundswells and made business successful, but of course I've only ever made other men extraordinarily rich, so oh, if only I had have owned those businesses, eh? The point I make is that we need to understand that we're only as strong as our community. That is the whole point. Maybe that's what um, COVID has possibly brought to the fore is that if we don't cooperate with each other and things get grim, pretty soon people just push and shove and, and run over the top of each other regardless of how many die. And we see it happen all of the time. And unfortunately, not too many people voluntarily behave. And there's been this big push to be more kind and considerate during these periods of time. But why would anyone ever have to say that sort of thing? That would be because we were never, never ever terribly kind or terribly considerate to begin with. In fact, for the last three generations, we've been encouraged to be more and more selfish, to treat others with so much disregard that now we no longer speak of people in the first, second or third person. We speak of them as inanimate objects. And what I mean by that is you no longer say I, you no longer say me, 
you no longer say we, she, they. Now we refer to human beings as that. And that is an inanimate object like a stone or a tree. A that rather than that person. It's just that. The person that does this, not the person who does this. So we have dehumanised things, we have depersonalised things, and that little Freudian slip that's only been around for the last couple of years is evidence, you know, audible evidence of the disregard. People don't use crossings. They'd rather hold up traffic and do something illegal walk three metres down and use a crossing that protects them legally. And drivers, they see people waiting, they don't stop. It's illegal, they don't stop. They don't stick to the speed limits either. I was following a guy today towing a horse in a horse float, doing 120. I just sped up to see what speed he was doing. 120. Interesting. Ticket, instant ticket, big old fight. He doesn't care. That's why I call it the idiot tax. Because nobody has to get a speeding ticket. Nobody has to. I can understand if, you know, you're overtaking somebody and you accidentally get up a bit. But that's not what I see. I see reckless disregard for others to the point where there are hundreds, half a thousand die on the years on the roads in a year and that's just those that die that's not counting those that have got broken arms broken legs broken necks broken backs who will never walk again who will never function properly again who will never be able to hold down a job again people will look at them like circus freaks for the rest of their life because they're all buckled and broken and why they made some very 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 poor decisions which they came to regret for the rest of their lives if they're lucky enough to live. And every time I drive in here from Pahia to to Marston, I look at another crash and another crash and another crash. Big skid marks, whack through the barrier, down the bank. Every week I see wrecks sitting out in paddocks, you know, cartwheeled across the paddock. And this is not because some animal ran out. State Highway 2 is completely stock safe. I've only ever come across one dog running on the road once. I've never seen a cow, a horse, a pig, anything. Those farmers have got their places locked up real tight because they know what goes wrong should their stock stray. It's not an issue and it's not a problem. The only thing that causes accidents on State Highway 2 is drivers. And that's it. And it's the sole reason. Even bad weather, I've, I've noticed people speed up when it rains. I don't know what that's about, but it is. And I worry about it. It concerns me, the amount of death, the amount of injury, because of the amount of mental anguish this causes those who have to pick up the pieces or those that are left behind at the grave. Nothing breaks my heart more, nothing saddens me more than to see people whacking them out before their time because of an act of stupidity. They try and save themselves 10 seconds and it costs them their lives. Not worth it, is it? And I don't want you to think about yourself because you're obviously too stupid for that. Think about those around you. Think about how it's going to affect them. Take a second look at your behaviour and think, well, don't they deserve to have me around? You know, what I'm doing is reckless. And you know it's reckless. And it's not, it's not exciting, it's not fun. I can guarantee you it's not. When you go off a cliff, all of a sudden she's no longer fun ever again. Once you see the wreckage and you've sat there in intensive care looking at people that have been busted to bits, it's not fun or exciting anymore. It's no more wee, it's no more vroom vroom. Yeah, it's like the guy says in the ad, the Asian guy. It'd be like, snap, and then all quiet, not talk anymore. And he's absolutely on the money, that chap, isn't he, eh? All quiet, not like before. It's a horrible, horrible thing. And we have to do everything we can, not just to lower the road toll. It's not about forcing people to be compliant. That initially has to be done. But it is about 
changing the culture. It is about the conversation, and that's why I'm doing this on this radio. Is I hope that people will talk about this, and and the more this conversation is had, the more the truth can come to the light. That you know, being an idiot, being reckless and dangerous, and 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 putting people's lives at risk. Just think a little bit, because you're isolated in that car. You're isolated from reality. You think that you're inside some kind of T-34, 50-ton tank. It's not the case. Once that car hits something solid at a hell of a speed, you realise there's no protection whatsoever. You might as well be sitting in a paper bag because you're about to be crushed to smithereens. So, you know, um, it is far, far, far more dangerous than you realise when you're zooming along at 100 kilometres an hour, you don't really realise how fast that is until you hit something. And then you realise that, boy, when you stop, you go from 100 to zero. Like that, the chances of you walking away, almost zero. And you hit someone head on, 100 plus 100 and a bit. Hmm. It's a hell of a mess. And, you know, it It affects me. It affects me as a person because I know what all those families go through because I've been through it myself a few times. And, you know, this, this feeling of having been robbed, you know, this, this anger that you have, yes, there's, there's the sadness and there's the missing and there's the shame and there's the crying, but also there's this anger at their stupidity that they should have cheated their children of, of a father or a mother is, is, is the worst thing of all. And I don't like to dwell on things like this. It's not my game to play the violin strings, but, you know, this is a problem so bad that we need to address it. It is, it is like a, a cancer of on our society, you know, suicide and depression. These things happen because of our society. We live in the most beautiful country in the world and most kids are, are born good kids. They're not liars, they're not cheats, they're not thieves, they're not murderers, they're not wife beaters, none of that. They're just good, innocent little children. Society makes them the way they are and we set up a quarter of our society for instant failure in our school systems, um, in our society in general, the jobs that you are able to take once you've failed at school are extremely limited, the way that society treats you and looks down on you, judges you. You go to a party, what's the first thing they ask you? Oh, what do you do? You know, how do I measure you? Are you a good person? Are you a doctor or a nurse or... Are you just a sad sack of you-know-what because you dig holes for a living? And we are far too judgmental. There is this uh, class system that is reinforced in the back of their minds which grades people according to the jobs that they hold. Nothing to do with are they good people, you know, the content of their character. No one would ever go up to you at a party and say, how much good do you do for society? It would be a ridiculously laughable question, but when you think about it, which of those two questions is more relevant? What do you do for a living, or are you a good person? I think the latter should take precedence, and yet, like I said, it would be a laughable thing to consider that. So that's how far we are away from that sea change, from that societal change that we need to get to. That's the place we need to be where we work in synchronicity with each other so that one person assists in the success of another rather than pitting themselves against each other in an adversarial way where I have to win and you have to fail or you have to win and I have to fail. It should never have to come to that. We have to work to get ourselves in a situation where you win and I win, and we both feel happy about that. Neither of us feels cheated. You might have more than me, but as long as I have enough, that's just fine. I have no nothing against people aspiring. I encourage that. I encourage people to become wealthy through their own hard graft. 
As long as it's done honestly and you haven't stabbed anyone or screwed anyone on the way there, if you've done good work and you've made lots of money and you've achieved and you're a millionaire, all power to you. I love what, what you've done. I love people who do that. I have friends who have started from nothing, absolutely nothing, and aspired and gained things. And now people look at them and spit on them because they're wealthy. They weren't born with a plum in their mouth or a silver spoon or any other damn thing. They worked hard, they sacrificed, they used their brains, they used their skills. Some of them went to university and dedicated their lives to what they do. Others never had the chance to do stuff like that because they were told they weren't so smart. It turns out they were that smart and they went on to succeed and become millionaires in their own right regardless of the fact that they didn't have the so-called qualifications it takes to make money. That's bullshit. I know people that never even got school C and are multi-millionaires at this, to this day. Some of the smartest, most skillful people that I know were probably autistic to some degree or maybe just dyslexic when they were young, had trouble reading and writing, they weren't too good with the symbols and, and, and the words. Didn't mean their brains didn't work well, it just means that they were wired differently and schools couldn't accommodate that. So when they left, I'm thinking of someone like Stu McNeil, never got any great qualifications. That chap's one of the smartest men I know. The things he knows almost no other human being does. An extraordinary, an extraordinarily capable hunter, fisherman, mechanic, builder, carpenter, you name it, he can do it. But he's clever with it too. We sit there and theorise about the life cycles of animals in the sea and stuff like that. And, you know, he spends a lot of time thinking about things like that and, and reads a fair bit. You know, this is a guy, I don't think he even got school C, but he loves reading. He loves reading stories of, of, of extreme things like Shackleton and Endurance and stuff like that, and I can sit on the porch and chat away to him about things like that, that I couldn't speak to any well-educated university graduate because they've just never come across things like this. They've become far more specialised in their field, so... What we hold up to be good and great, I would suggest, needs a bit more reassessment because people have all kinds of different skills and abilities and just because you're not good at what everyone finds um, important or rewards financially doesn't mean you don't have skills. I don't think there's too many people I've come across in my lifetime that aren't good at something. Now... That thing that they're good at might not be held in that higher esteem in society, but it doesn't mean it's not important. If you're good at something, that is important. It's important to you, but it's also important to people like me who appreciate skills and abilities. I love well-made things regardless of what they are, and sometimes people are surprised that I take interest in some things that might be considered girly, but... I was raised by two sisters and a mother, so it's hardly surprising that I have an appreciation for uh, well-made clothes because my sisters, and, and especially my mum, used to make their own. So I have an appreciation for um, skill regardless of what it might be. It doesn't have to be a blokey thing. And I think if you're to be a man, to be a real man, I think you need to appreciate you know, the skills and abilities, not just of other men, but of women and of children as well. You know, it's amazing how naturally clever kids can be if you give them a Meccano set or something like that. I know a lot of people don't know what that is, but believe you me, for a young girl or boy, they're awesome fun. They're, they're kind of like bolt together bits of metal that you make things out of, a predecessor to Lego. And they're just... So much fun because it encourages you to be creative and use your imagination and come up with ideas. And I, I really believe that that's what children need, is not to have things laid on, but to have challenges put in front of them. Physical, mental, intellectual challenges. And, and this is how you make young people equipped for the world, by getting out there and pushing them to do something new, to open their minds and to 
achieve what they can and be encouraged with that and then if they show some enthusiasm or interest to then try and achieve more, to set goals, to become better, to practice what it is to become better at something. And I think that's how we make our kids better. Too often they just do the same old, same old thing and then they sit there and say, I'm bored. Well, hey, I would suggest if some kid's sitting there saying I'm bored, they are crying out for a challenge. And you have to get the grey matter upstairs into gear and think, well, how can I engage this young person? Because if they just go, oh, I'm bored, oh, I'm bored, oh, I'm bored, well, they're just going to rot. You know, they're crying out for help. It may be you think that they're just annoying and antagonising you, but they're not. What they're saying is they need more. They just don't know how to say that yet. They just know what they're feeling because they're very emotional creatures when they're young. I remember what it was like, you know. Held the skelter, emotions going everywhere, hormones going crazy. It's very difficult to be focused when you're young, especially when you reach puberty. Everything goes la-la for a few years. So helping people, older people, helping to steer those younger people in the right direction as guides, not as, as, as brutal masters or dominate or force them. Um, none of this because I said so stuff. You know, don't be impatient and intolerant. If you're doing something for, for the young person's own good, try to explain that to them. Try and be just a, a little bit more patient and considerate. And often the reaction of those young people, if they can understand something, they can accept it. Sometimes they'll rebel and rally against it. And they have to be able to do that because that's what being young is all about. You're testing boundaries and limits and often you'll go over them and offend people and hurt people just to see what happens. You know, you're going to pour petrol on it and you're going to light it just to see what happens. It's, it's a mixture of curiosity and rebelliousness, of finding one's way in the world, and it's not necessarily always an evil thing that's driving them. They might have done bad things, but they didn't necessarily have evil intentions when they smashed those dirty windows. You know, it was just one of those... <sighs> Stupid things that young people do sometimes, they do. And, and young people have to be allowed to be stupid and crazy and young and reckless and as long as we can keep them from destroying themselves, I don't see a problem, you know. They have to let a bit of steam off. You know, if you raise a dog from a puppy to an adult, they have very short lives, so you see the transition. When they're young, they just run, 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 and they drive you absolutely crazy, pester you, bite you, especially when they're pups. They have needle-sharp teeth. They bite you all the time because they're, they're curious about their world, so they're always using their mouths, as, as babies do, to, to discover their world, and then... As they get a little bit older, and they're still very much in, in that very young, they're so full of energy, sometimes they just run in circles. They've got so much to burn off, and I remember what it was like. I remember as, as a, you know, a pre-teen from the ages of, of, I don't know, four to probably 14, but certainly in the younger years at primary school, we would just run in circles. When we went to our breaks, we would run out of the door onto the fields and the teachers would shout, no running in the corridors, and we would go screaming out. And I mean, literally, we, we would all just be screaming at the tops of our voices. And you could hear it for blocks away of hundreds of children screaming with joy at the tops of their voices to be out and about because to be... Shut in, even for an hour, is interminably long when you're a young person. And the more you can get out there and scream and shout and run in circles, the happier you're going to be, the more freedom that you can be allowed within safe parameters when you're young. I'm not saying we should go and arm each other with swords and spears, but teach each other to play 
and play aggressively without harming each other. This is what I'm talking about, is allowing young people a bit of rope, but also making them understand that there are certain boundaries and parameters and why. The most important bit is the why. If young people can understand, they can buy into it. If you are standing here wagging your finger, dominating and dictating, they will only hate you. They will hate you, they will despise you, and they're not going to do what you tell them to. They're going to do the opposite. They're going to go, if you, I won't do what you tell me. You know, and, and, and that's the way kids are. You know, the harder you clamp down on them, the more likely they are to take any opportunity they can to sneak behind your back and do something just to pee you off and they will I did it many a time the more they hit me the more they beat me the more they punished me the worse I got and it just snowballed and snowballed and snowballed you know some of my friends became one man crime waves luckily I never quite (laughs) got the addiction for any possible thing that I needed to steal but Certainly we were more than rebellious. We were destructive and antisocial, to say the very least. And that was because there was an intolerance. If you broke the rules, you'd be whipped, literally whipped with a cane, whipped with a belt, you know, beaten into submission. And they would say things like, oh, we're going to knock the sharp edges off you, boy. Well, they never ever did. They never ever will. They never ever could. And... You know, all that makes is is for damage and destruction into society because the kids don't just get back at you. It damages them mentally and they carry that forward and treat other people as they've been treated. You know, the children look up to their parents. The biggest influence in a child's life by a million miles is that dominant parent and they will mimic what you do. So all of those bad habits that you teach them over time that intolerance that because i said so the whacking and all the rest of it they pick up on that and they mirror you later on in life if you're an f up in life they're likely to be too if you're an evil criminal they're likely to be too the chances of them following you are about 80 to 90 percent the chances of you doing the something different to you are about 15%, the chances of them being the opposite of you were about 5%, if that, sometimes down to 1%, depending on the type of community. If the community is chokingly dominant, very few ever break out of it, and if they do, they normally tend to leave you and never come back. So what I'm saying is you need to get the young ones and even older people to understand why we have to do this together. For each other's good. This is for the common good. This is not telling you to do what to do because I'm trying to dominate you or punish you or get one over on you. It's for all of our good so that we can move forward and achieve more as a community than what we can do as a bunch of disparate individuals. That's me for another day. I know that it goes so quickly. Um, I will get back to reading my stories very shortly, but there are some issues that I just need to cover at this point of time whilst we have the opportunity to make a change for the better during this COVID thing, to make it a kinder and more thoughtful and a better world and realise that, you know, it's high time that we reassess the situation and realise that society needs to cooperate more with itself, businesses with businesses, people with people at every level of society and that's why I work for a community radio station and, and why Rapper TV, of course, and I want to say thank you to all of them, to the sponsors, to Michael and Veronica who run Arrow Radio, to our friends on the carpety and, and up in the Hawke's Bay and the Wairap, all you good folks who support this station, all of the, um, you know, all of the sponsors, thanks very, very much for making this happen because I think... This is something that can come out of COVID, you know, community radios, not-for-profit organisations that are by the community for the community to help us create better bonds and grow, to bring the townies and and the country folk, urban and rural, together and realise that, hey, we actually need each other. And I hope COVID has brought that home about how much we need to rely on each other and help each other, not just to get over this 
But in society, now and forever, we need to create those bonds and understand each other better. And my show is just about helping people understand folks who seem very different are not really that different at all. They're pretty much just the same as you. All of us are. I want you to take that with you this week and realise that we're in this together and we are all the same brothers and sisters together. So, you know, do your bit if you can. It would be very much appreciated. Okay, well, I'll catch you again next week, and uh, who knows? Maybe instead of just yakking for half an hour, I'll bring you a story, eh? Okay, bye for now. Cheers. (laughs) 